Path 2 Thamma Puja When Ajahn Kao lived in the forests and the mountains, he got the local villagers to lay out three different paths for walking meditation. He walked Chankama on these three paths at three different times each day. In the early afternoon, he started walking on the path dedicated to Thamma Puja, the completely pure Chitta. A bad fever afflicted Adan Kao the following Vassa, but his relentless efforts against the Gilesas continued. Neither side would back down. The fever remained with him throughout the Vassa, but his examination of the painful feelings in the body, which is the home of suffering, never weakened or gave way. However strong the fever and however much the suffering, it was as though they acted as fuel for mindfulness and wisdom, causing them to show their skillfulness to the utmost. His heart took up the pain that arose from the fever in his body, which was the basis of his suffering, and used those painful feelings like a boxing ring to stage a fight against the Gilesas, which were so punishing they gave no break for rest at the end of each round. If mindfulness and wisdom had relaxed or given way, the fever would have lain him out cold and probably killed him. So he and his Gilesas fought together in the manner of a life or death struggle. Neither the fever nor his suffering eased or gave way at all, so his striving could not give way either. If he gave way, he could not keep up with the Gilesas and destroy them, so the outcome depended on his diligent effort. As there was no way he could avoid the situation, he was forced to keep on struggling until he understood the reasons behind his suffering. Only then was he able to be victorious and gain confidence in his ability. That Vassa was extremely difficult. Because he suffered malarial fever throughout the whole retreat period, he was required to push himself to the limit, both physically and mentally. The physical pain was excruciating, while in his heart he was striving relentlessly to follow the fever and the painful feelings. After the end of the Vassa, his fever gradually subsided and went away. He then left and went wandering in solitude going from place to place as it suited his inclinations, without attachment to anything except only his efforts in meditation. It was then the season when the rice was harvested. One evening after he swept the ground around his hut, he went off to take a bath. As he was walking along, he saw how the rice growing in the fields was golden yellow and almost ripe. This immediately made him think and question, This rice? has sprouted and grown because there is a seed which caused it to grow. The heart that endlessly leads one to birth and death must also have something that acts as a seed within it in the same way the rice plants have. If that seed in the heart is not destroyed entirely, it is bound to lead to further births and deaths going on endlessly. Now, what is this seed in the heart? What could it be? But the Gilesas of Idzatanha and Upadana. He continued thinking and probing into this problem, taking Avidza as the target of his research. He investigated it by going forward and then backward, backward and then forward, examining it over and over again with intense interest, trying to understand the true nature of Avidza. Beginning at dusk and continuing throughout the night, he went on relentlessly investigating the relationship between Avidja and the Chitta. At dawn, just as it was beginning to get light, his wisdom was able to break through to a final conclusion. Avidja then fell away from the Chitta without any remainder. The contemplation of the rice stopped at the point where the rice was ripe, never to sprout again. His investigation into the Chitta also stopped as soon as Avidja ceased, after which the Chitta became ripe in the same way as the rice became ripe. At that point it was clearly evident to him that the Chitta had stopped creating any more births in the various realms of existence. What remained for him to admire to his complete satisfaction as he sat in his hut in the midst of the mountains was the complete and utter purity of the Chitta. At the moment the Chitta passed beyond the tangled jungles of the round of Gilesas, Gilesa Watta, 
Wonder and amazement arose in him as he sat alone at dawn. Then the sun began to shine brightly in the sky, while his heart began to get brighter and brighter as it left the realm of Avidja and went towards the wonder of Tamma, where it reached Limutti, freedom, as the sun rose above the mountains. It was truly a most auspicious and wonderful occasion. After this supremely auspicious and blessed moment had passed, it was time for him to go Pindapada. While he was walking away from that auspicious place, he looked back at the little hut that had provided him with so much happiness and such wonders. Then, looking all around him, he saw how everything else appeared to have become supremely auspicious in sympathy with his heart, which was entirely and completely wonderful throughout. Although, in fact, all these things were simply there in accordance with their own nature as usual. While walking on Pindapata, his heart was filled with Tamma. When he looked at the local forest people who had looked after him, it seemed almost as if they were all divine beings. He reflected on all the assistance they had so graciously given him, and he felt that it would be impossible to describe the extent of their virtue. Metta and compassion arose in him for those heavenly forest people. He could not help but spread out the metta in his citta as a dedication to them as he passed by them along the route, which he did until he reached the vicinity of the hut where he stayed, which was a place of such happiness. While he arranged the simple food which the hill people had put into his bowl, his heart was full of tamma. He did not turn his thoughts to the food that had always sustained his body, but he merely ate it as that which the body depended upon for its maintenance. He later recalled, Since the day I was born, this was the first time that I had ever experienced the body and mind in perfect harmony with the citta, which is something quite impossible to explain. All I can say is that it was a most wonderful and unique experience that became the most outstanding event of my life, leaving a deep and lasting impression on my heart. After this world-shaking event occurred, when the sky and ground collapsed, and the wheel of Sangsara, the Vattachakka in the heart, broke up and disappeared, all the elements and kantas, as well as every part and aspect of the citta, were all free to conform to their own natural state. They were no longer enslaved or forced into service by anything. The five Indriya and the five Ayatana will continue to function and do their duties until they disappear at death, but there won't be any dispute between them as there was in the past. The dispute he referred to is the disharmony between internal sense bases and external objects when they come into contact. This contact in turn gives rise to gladness or sorrow, that then turns into the arising of sukha and dukkha. All these are interconnected like the links of an endless chain going on forever. The disputes within the citta, which are far more numerous and disturbing than those externally in the world, all stopped at the moment the court of justice was finally established within the heart. Such troublesome disputes used to take the citta as the arena where they would dance about, arguing and quarreling. The citta was never given any time to be calm and quiet, because Avidza Dhanha, the boss, directed and ordered it to cause turmoil and confusion of countless different kinds. But now all of that has dissolved into a joyful, harmonious state of peaceful calm. The world within the citta is now free and empty. Now only the most superb and excellent truths of Tamma, Vidza Tamma, are produced there, which allows me to enjoy the realm of the Chitta King, instead of the former state of anti-Tamma. Affairs, both external and internal, now proceed smoothly in accordance with Tamma, without being harassed and disturbed by an enemy. So the eyes see, the ears hear, the nose smells, the tongue tastes, the body feels things hot or cold, soft or hard, and the heart receives and knows the various supporters of perception, Aramana, in its natural way, without distorting and altering everything as it used to, 
making out that right is wrong, that being shackled is freedom, that what is bad is good, that ghosts are people, that virtuous bhikkhus are evil ghosts, preta, and conversely that evil ghosts are good people. That is what the lord of Antitamma used to do when he had the power to dictate. Now I can simply sit down and rest peacefully, knowing that whether I live or die I have complete happiness. I am genuinely free of dukkha and free of danger, without any residue of attachment of any sort whatsoever. This was the aphorism that Venerable Adan Kao exclaimed in his heart at that time. Adan Kao was one of several of Venerable Adan Mun's disciples who stripped away all dukkha and got rid of all dangers from his heart while living and practicing in Chiang Mai province. He said, The place where I practiced the way until I reached freedom from the dukkha within me made a strong impression on me. There was the little hut which gave me shelter so I could practice and strive and also rest my body. The paths where I walked Chankama, the place where I sat in Samadhi meditation day and night, and the village where I walked for Pindabhata to get food for maintaining my body. All of them made a great impression that went deep into my heart in an inexplicable way, far more so than any other place I ever lived at. This feeling has remained buried in my heart right up to the present day, and my memory of that place has never faded or become dull and stale. From the moment when the wheel of Sangsara was demolished and fell away from my heart, that place changed and became the abode of supreme happiness in all situations at all times. It was as if I were in the presence of the Lord Buddha at the place of his enlightenment and every other place where he practiced striving for Tamma. All uncertainty about the Lord Buddha was swept away at that moment. Even though he entered Parinibbana a long time ago, as reckoned by the usual conventions of time, yet it seems as though he is residing here in my heart every moment, as though he had never entered Parinibbana at all. All of my uncertainties about the true nature of Tamma, whether it is much or little, profound or shallow, gross or subtle, were entirely swept away. I understood that Tamma is permanently established in this one heart, and that this Tamma is complete in and of itself without any deficiencies whatsoever. All doubt and uncertainty disappeared concerning the Savaka Sankha, which is Supatipanno. These three jewels of absolute purity are fused into one in the heart that lives with Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, each of which are pure and integrated together as one Tamma. From that time on, I have remained completely contented with no concerns or worries deceiving my heart. Whatever my circumstances, I am my own master in that situation. Nothing remains to order me about or to creep in and ask for a share of everything, like a parasite, as when I was living with that beggar all the time without realizing it. First it wanted this, then it wanted that. It was always pleading for something. When Atan Kao spoke of wanting this and wanting that, he was talking about the Gilesas, whose basic nature is to always feel needy and unsatisfied. Once they have established a powerful position in the heart of a person or animal, they are bound to demand or beg incessantly, for this is their natural way of acting. They constantly incite us to think like this, or to speak like that, or to act in various ways according to their power. If we don't have the tamma needed to prevent the leakage which comes from the stubborn demanding and begging of this gang of gilesas, we are likely to be divided up as spoils so that they can eat us up until there is nothing left. It can even reach the point where we don't have enough virtue left to enable us to be born again in the future as a good person with moral principles. Wherever we are reborn, it is bound to be the wrong place and the wrong situation. We won't be able to get sufficient contentment in our next birth to justify the effort we made to be born into such a state. Then we will have lost not only our capital, but the interest from it as well. In other words, when we are heedless and complacent, we grant the Gilesas the power to take complete charge of the Chitta, without having any defense to resist them at all. They then take over and grab until there's nothing left. 
But those who get rid of all their debts and put an end to the untidy mess in their hearts continue to live happily in all the activities of their kanthas. When life comes to an end, they drop the burden of the kanthas. All that remains is the purity of Buddha. This is the complete and eternal end of all Dukkha, a wonderful ending and a moment of far greater value than anything in the three worlds. It is quite different from existence in the world of conventions, Samudhi, where most beings openly desire birth and are not in the least interested to consider the Dukkha which is bound to come as a consequence of that birth. The truth is that birth and Dukkha cannot be separated. Even in those cases where it is minimal, Dukkha is still bound to be there. The wisest of men are therefore far more afraid of birth than they are of death. By contrast, most of us fear death more than birth, but death is simply a result of its basic cause, which is birth. This fear of death is a fear that is in complete opposition to the basic principles of nature, and it comes about because people have no interest in searching out the truth about death. Indeed, they resist it, so Dukkha is with them all the time. If the wisest of men had the kind of gilesas that made them laugh at others' foolishness, they would probably be unable to contain themselves and may have to let it all out to their heart's content when they see almost everyone in the world setting themselves against the truth with such determination, without ever looking around to search for the basic principles of truth. But actually, the truly wise do not act in the usual way of the world. They have only metta and compassion for the world, giving help by teaching the way. As for those who are beyond all hope, the wise let them go their way, as nothing can be done to help them. Venerable Ajahn Kao transcended all the fear and danger that he used to have in Sangsara, and reached Nibbana while still alive. Saubadises and Nibbana, when living in a place called Longkot in the Prao district of Chiang Mai province, in his sixteenth or seventeenth Vassa. I cannot remember which, but I do know that it was the beginning of the harvest season just after the end of the Vassa period. He related the whole story to me in a manner that touched the heart one evening, as we discussed Tamma from 8 p.m. until after midnight. Because nobody came to disturb us for the whole of that time, both of us were able to talk tamma freely, right through to the final conclusion, which was the final result that arose from our practice of tamma. We started from the basic ABCs of our respective practices, which meant the basic training that we did, which was a mixture of slipping back and scrambling up again, at times falling into a bad state, or a state that alternated between bad and good, and at other times feeling the satisfaction or dejection which resulted from the ups and downs of the practices that we used in our initial training. We went on right through our meditation until we each reached the ultimate and final point of the chitta and tamma. The results of my discussion with him were so satisfying that I have taken the opportunity to include his comments in this book, so that those who read it and are interested in attaining tamma may use it as a field for contemplation. They can then choose which aspects are suitable for them to use in their own practice, depending on their own temperaments. The result which comes from such a discriminating choice is likely to be a smooth and steady development that is right and appropriate, depending on the strength of one's resolve. Adan Kao was entirely qualified to be a constant source of great value for those in the world who associated with him. His outward behavior was impeccable, as was his inward knowing of the way of Tamma which was like a diamond of the first water buried deeply within him. Such a precious gem is extremely hard to find, and can only be found by someone who has returned from the threshold of death. I have secretly given him the name Diamond of the First Water in the Kamartana lineage of Venerable Ajahn Man, without being afraid that people will call me mad, because this arose from my own faith. Return to the Northeast. Venerable Ajahn Kao spent the Vassa of 1945 to 46 in Meanong Han, Sunsai District, Chiang Mai Province. During the Vassa, he kindly gave a number of Tamma talks to teach and instill faith into the people there. By that time, 
his chitta had already gone free from the thick jungle and emerged into the land of boundless, wide open space. His chitta had become a space chitta, and his tamma had become space tamma. Both of them interfused into one in complete fulfillment. Nothing ever came to obstruct and deceive him like it used to. He continued his normal daily activities for the sake of maintaining the body in the kanthas, so that the tamma dwelling place, Vihara tamma, of the chitta in this world, the tatamma, would remain convenient and comfortable. After the vasa, he reflected back on his life before he set out to search for tamma and for the path, fruition, and nibbana by way of the constant practice of tutangakamatana. His past often came back to remind him of the promise he had made shortly after he was ordained. He had determined then that he would leave in order to search for the tamma, in order to attain the path, fruition, and nibbana, and nothing else. When all the people and Adans opposed him and tried to stop him from going away, he then announced with complete sincerity that, after I have gone, if I have not experienced tamma, which is the path, fruition and nibbana fully in my heart, I will not return to let you ridicule me as a failure to my face. This is my firm resolve. I will return only if I have this tamma as my guarantee. I would like all of you to understand now that it will be a long time before I return to see you again. By then you may have forgotten what I just told you. When he had fully thought about it, he came to a definite decision and said farewell to all his friends and relatives who were attached to him and did not want him to go. But necessity compelled him to make a break with them, following the law of change which is bound to bring about separation between people, both while living and at death, so everyone has to accept this natural principle. With that past incident fresh in his mind, Ajahn Kao asked Ajahn Wayan Sujino to accompany him back to the northeastern region, Isan, to visit his home village and all his friends and relatives who he had left twenty years ago. Should he wait any longer, he was concerned that either he or they might die before there was a chance to meet again. Also, were he to go now, he would have a very good opportunity to visit and pay his respects to Venerable Ajahn Man Puridatta who at that time was spending the vasa in Nongpo Nanai village in the Panna Nanikuan district of Sukon Nakuan province, an area where many Tutanga Kamartana bhikkhus lived and practiced. But Ajahn Wayan said that he would not go back as long as he had still not attained the level of Arahant, which was the goal that he was fully intent on achieving. He felt that he had to stay put and go on developing until he reached his goal. Then he could leave Chiang Mai and go elsewhere if he wanted to. But if he did not want to go anywhere, he would go on living in Chiang Mai until he died. He told Ajahn Kao, As for you, if you have attained Arahantship, it would be very good if you spread the tamma among the bhikkhus and villagers. To that I give my full approval and blessing. But please don't bring out the Gilesas and false tamma to spread about to other people, because the Gilesas and false tamma are abundant everywhere where people live in this world. In fact, they are never lacking in the hearts of those living in the world nowadays. For that reason, the world is full of trouble and turbulence and unable to find calm and peace either in body or in mind. Wherever we go, we hear nothing but complaints that life is full of suffering and difficulty, full of hardships and deprivations. Even in the villages and towns where they reckon that they are experiencing progress and development, we still hear complaints about suffering and difficulty. So when you go to the northeastern region, please teach tamma that is correct and complete, not lacking in any way. Tamma that is calming and peaceful, not complaining and agitated. This is what you should take to give to them, so that your relatives and friends will all be full of gratitude and joy that you have come to visit. At present, I am still fighting against the false tamma which makes me intoxicated. I haven't yet sobered up. I'm intoxicated while sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. When sitting in samadhi, I'm intoxicated. Walking Jangamapawana, I'm intoxicated. The kilesas that lead me into careless intoxication are still not ready to get off my shoulders, my back, my neck, and my heart. 
However I twist and turn about, the intoxicating kilesas continue to do their work, interfering with all my actions of body, speech, and mind. I have no way of knowing when I will be able to cure these intoxicants. But please go to Isan and teach them about Madanimandano, that pamma which causes intoxicants to abate. Watto Pachedo, that pamma which cuts out the worldly chitta. Tanhakayo, that pamma which destroys craving. Virago, that pamma which is the end of raga, the pleasure of excitement. Niroto, that pamma which quenches all the gilesas. Nibbana, the final and complete destruction of all the gilesas and the relative world of appearance. Go and spread these tammas about in the monasteries and villages. People will be very glad and show their appreciation to you who have been away for such a long time. That's what Ajahn Wan told Ajahn Kao when he was about to return to Isan. Ajahn Wan did not accompany him, for he wanted to develop his practice until he attained the state of Arahant first. He had to put off any travel plans until after he had reached the goal that his heart was set on. So instead, Ajahn Kao asked Ajahn Tob and Ujan Butra to accompany him. Then the three of them left Chiang Mai and began walking cross-country to Isan, where they intended first to pay their respects to Venerable Ajahn Mun at Wat Ban Nong Pe in the district of Nanai, Sakon Nakon province. The night before they reached there, they stopped to rest for the night. While Ajahn Kao was doing his meditation practice, he thought reverently of Venerable Ajahn Mun reflecting in his heart how at that time Ajahn Mun was probably sitting in meditation and looking right into their hearts and minds, seeing everything quite clearly throughout. Ajahn Kao suspected that even before they had reached him, there was probably nothing within their hearts that Ajahn Mun had not found out with his super-knowing yarna. It was rather amazing that what he thought turned out to be true, for when they got there and met Venerable Ajahn Mun, he gave them an important talk on Tamma, saying, Being afraid that other people will look into your heart and mind, rather than being concerned about looking into your own heart and mind to see what's there, is simply wasting your time dreaming and thinking externally while having no interest in thinking about going into your own body and mind. Where else can we who practice the way find the ability to be circumspect? Those who practice so as to know the basic principles of truth must look at themselves and their own hearts, the major cause of all problems, far more than looking at things outside themselves. They must also find a method of guarding themselves and their hearts by being careful and watchful in all postures and situations. They must use their mindfulness and wisdom to recollect and learn from their past experience, so they can think about and work out how to deal with each incident that they meet up with. They must not be careless and indifferent with anything in the sphere of the relative world of convention, which is nothing but the sphere of Dukkha, the sphere of birth and death of all beings in the world. After having rested and listened to Venerable Ajahn Mun's Thamma, which gave them a feeling of uplift and joy, they saluted him and took their leave. They then went wandering in the vicinity of Ajahn Mun's forest monastery to find solitude, practicing the way of Gamertana in places such as Ban Gok Manao and Ban Gut Bak in the Gut Bak district, Sagon Nakon province. They promoted their striving in Thamma continuously in that area for several months after which they all set off to go to Adan Kao's home village. When they reached his home village where he was born and grew up, all the people there, including his relatives and friends, were very happy and elated to hear about his arrival. They asked him to have Mitta for them by spending the next Vasa period there. When he agreed, they built a hut for him to stay the Vasa at Boatseneng, which was the name of his home village. After the Vasa period, Ajahn Kao said farewell to all his relatives and friends and returned to Zagon Nakon province. There he went wandering in various districts, where there were forests and hills which were suitable for practicing the way of Samarna Tamma, such as the foothills of Puban and Pulek ranges in the district of Sawang Dandian. He spent several Vasa periods in that area, one year at Nongluang village, another at Tumbed, another at Watsanoi village, and another at Chumbon village, all of which are within the boundaries of the district of Sawang Dandin, Sakon Nakuan province. He had a few bhikkhus and novices with him, but not many, because he did not want a lot of people following him around. 
It would have been too disturbing and too difficult to find suitable places to stay and practice, as well as being difficult to gather food in Pindabada. He preferred staying near small villages, composed of not more than five, six, or seven houses, as this provided the most suitable conditions for the way of Samarnatamma by avoiding the disturbances of a large crowd of bhikkhus and novices, constantly coming and going, as he had found in the larger villages and monasteries he had seen. Atan Kao was so absolutely resolute and resourceful in striving that it would be hard to find anyone else to equal him. When it came to striving in the way of Tamma, even in old age he still remained very skilled and resolute without weakening. When he walked Jankama, he continued for five or six hours each time before taking a rest. Even the young bhikkhus could not equal him. The striving of the wisest men is so very different from that of the rest of us, who tend to look forward more to the time when we can rest our heads on our pillows, as if pillows are more exalted than the path fruition and nibbana, which, when one looks at it and thinks about it, should make us ashamed of how clever we are in those ways that are completely lacking in essential value. Visions of Ajahn Man For several years, Venerable Ajahn Kao spent the Vasa period living in the hills alone, relying on two or three families of farmers to give him food when he went out on Brindabadi each day. For those who are ordained as bhikkhus, this type of life provides the most happiness and peace of heart in the practice of Tamma. Since there are no other burdens or duties to trouble one, all one's time is filled with the effort to practice the way. One's time is always one's own. One's effort is one's own in every situation, and the chitta with tamma is one's own in all that one does. There is nothing distracting to divide one's attention, causing it to deteriorate. A bhikkhu who lives in the present, as if tonight is the only night left to him, is not concerned with how much longer he is going to live, or with other distractions, for what he is doing is of incomparably greater value than anything else. Venerable Ajahn Kao said that when he spent the Vasa period by himself in the hills along the borders of Sakonnakon and Galasin provinces, he lived in a place three or four miles distant from the nearest village. Many wild animals roamed that district, including tigers, elephants, wild oxen, red bulls, wild boar, barking deer, and various other kinds of deer. At night, he used to hear these animals' calls echoing through the forest as they roamed in search of food, often coming close to where he was staying. Sometimes they came so close that he could almost make out what kind of animal it was. Seeing these animals made him feel joyful with metta and compassion for them. It was soon after Venerable Ajahn Man died that Ajahn Kao spent the Vasa period in those hills. He said that when he practiced Samadhi meditation during that period, Ajahn Man came to visit him regularly in his meditation to talk about Tamma and give him friendly Tamma advice, Sammodaniya Tamma. When doing his routine duties in the vicinity of the cave where he stayed, or when arranging his few possessions, if he did anything improperly, Ajahn Man would point it out to him in his Samadhi meditation every time. For that reason, it seemed as though he was living with Ajahn Man for the whole of that Vasa period. Ajahn Man came into his meditation and told him about the customs and traditions of Tutanga bhikkhus who are intent on attaining freedom. He emphasized that the various Tutanga observances should be maintained and done properly in the way that the Lord Buddha prescribed. They should not be altered. Then he talked about the Tutanga practices that he taught his disciples to follow while he was still alive, repeating what he said for emphasis. Thus, Throughout my life, right up to the end, I taught my disciples to observe those Tutanga practices which I knew about with certainty, without any doubt at all. So you should take them to heart and practice them with a full and complete commitment. You should never think that the sasana is the exclusive property of the Lord Buddha or any of his savaka disciples. For in fact the sasana belongs to whoever cherishes it and is interested enough to practice the way, which includes everyone who aims to gain value from the sasana. 
the Lord Buddha and all the Savakas retained no part of the Sasana, which they gave fully and freely to the world. You should not think that the Lord and the Savakas would dispense both parts which were good as well as parts which were bad or tainted. Whether we practice the way rightly or wrongly is entirely up to each one of us. In no way does it depend on the Lord Buddha and the Savakas. You have come here with a specific purpose to practice the way. Whether you practice rightly or wrongly is also entirely up to you. So you must be very careful in what you do so as to live contentedly in the tamma of one who has seen the truth. You will shortly become an Atsariya with many followers, so you must set a good example to show what is right and seemly in order to be an exalted symbol of righteousness and truth and a blessing to all who follow after you, so that those who follow you will not be disappointed. Being an Atsariya is a very important position, so you should examine what it means carefully. For if the Atsariya himself goes wrong, he may also lead many others in the wrong direction. But if he does what is right, he can equally lead countless others in the right direction. You should therefore carefully examine all aspects of what it means to be an Atsariya with many followers. Others will then have an unobstructed, smooth path to follow which will not be false, because you, as their Atariya, taught them wrongly. The word Atariya means one who trains and develops his behavior, which is displayed externally in his actions and manners, in such a way that those who depend on him can hold him up as an example to be followed. His should not be the kind of behavior that displays falsehood due to a lack of prior thought and consideration. The Lord Buddha, who we call the Sasada, the great teacher of the world, was not the Sasada only at those times when he was giving a talk on Tamma to Buddhists who came to listen to him. He was the Sasada at all times, in every situation and position, whether reclining on his right side in the lion posture, sitting, standing, or walking about. Even when he was within a Buddhist monastery, the Lord would still be the Sasada in every action and every movement he made, never doing anything that was uncharacteristic of the Sasada. Therefore, Anyone who has mindfulness and wisdom, and an inclination towards critical assessment and contemplation, can always take every movement and every gesture that the Lord made as a teaching and a moral example. You should not think that the Lord ever behaved in an unrestrained manner, like worldly people who like to adjust and change their behavior depending on the people and circumstances that they come across, for they behave like this in one place and act like that in another which is the characteristic behavior of ghosts and pretas. There are both good people and bad people all over the world who do not have enough of a presence within them to hold on to as a firm, stable principle, so they cannot be a source of stability to others. Unlike worldly people, the Lord Buddha was the great teacher in everything he did right up to the day of final Nibbana. Whatever action or characteristic he displayed, he was always the Sazada, never being deficient or incapable. So whoever holds to him as a refuge, which means a basic principle or example of how one should act and behave, can do so at any time in whatever they are doing by following his example without any doubt as to whether the example of the Lord is suited to that occasion or not. This is why the title of the great teacher of the triple world system, Sazada, is well suited to the Lord. When the Lord was about to enter Parinibbana, he did so in a lion posture. He did not lie down carelessly as though he had thrown away his limbs and body, afraid of death and repeating mantras and magical verses so that he would go to this or that realm of existence, which is the way of ordinary people everywhere in the world. But he died composed, in the lion posture, and entered Parinibbana. Meanwhile, his heart went through the process of entering Nibbana with unwavering courage and discipline, as though he were about to go on living in the world for a long time to come. Actually, the Lord proclaimed that he was the great teacher in those final moments by entering the Chanas in Nirotasmapati and then withdrawing from them when the right moment came to enter Parinibbana, fully confirming his status as the great teacher without any remaining attachments to anything in the three worlds of existence. In this way, from the moment of his enlightenment to the time of his Parinibbana, the Lord Buddha made his behavior an example for the whole world to follow. He never reduced his standards of behavior below those required of the great teacher, behaving in any way like ordinary worldly people. 
he dutifully maintained his position of perfection right to the end. You should therefore take up the example of the Sasada and put it into practice. Although you will not be able to match the perfection of the Lord in all respects, your behavior will still be in the category of one who follows the word of the teacher, not drifting uncontrolled like a boat adrift in a storm in the middle of the ocean that has not put out its anchor. The practice of a monk who has no correct firmly established principles within him is likely to lack any real purpose that enables him to determine whether he will reach a safe shore or whether he will meet various dangers ahead. He is like a boat without a rudder that is not likely to be able to take him where he wants to go. Consequently, he is bound to drift with the ocean currents, which can easily lead him into great danger. The basic principles of Tamma and Vinaya, such as the Tutanga observances, are the rudders of the practice which lead it to a safe goal. Because of that, you should take hold of them and grasp them firmly. You must not waver or vacillate, which would lead those who follow you to follow a bad example and go wrong accordingly. The Tutanga observances are the practices which proceed directly towards the goal. No other practice can equal them in this. If those who practice the Tutangas use mindfulness, wisdom, faith, and effort in their striving, then that tamma which they are hoping to attain should be well within the scope of these practices. As they have been handed down to us by the Lord Buddha, it is quite certain that they are capable of leading us to success without any doubts or obstacles being able to prevent us. The Tutanga observances are the only way that can lead us beyond Dukkha. There is no other way, so you should not feel uncertain or doubtful. The Tutangas are the place where all the methods of practice converge and lead into the process of quenching all dukkha. Those bhikkhus who prefer the Tutanga observances as their mode of development are those who are faithful to the teaching of the Lord Buddha, who was the first teacher. Those bhikkhus who have taken up the Tutanga observances as their path of practice are those who have proper restraint, with the Buddha as their refuge in all situations. Wherever they go or stay, they have tamma to help protect them as a substitute for the sasada. They are not lonely, aimless, or unstable, for the heart's principle is the principle of tamma, and the principle of tamma is identical with the heart. Breathing in and breathing out is tamma, which is intimately blended into a single unity with the heart. Such people are always living with tamma, never being disturbed or biased. For yourself, it is true that you do not have anything to worry about in terms of tamma, but many people will associate with you in the future, so you must have concern for all those who follow you, both fellow monks and lay people as well, so that they may feel confident that the practices that they have picked up from you are the correct way to make progress without mistake. This was how Venerable Adan Mun taught Adan Kao as he sat in meditation. If he slept over the time for him to wake, even just a little, a Don Mun would come and point it out to him, saying, Don't trust yourself more than Tamma, for yourself is really just the round of samsara. The elements of the body and the kantas are results that have come from the round of samsara right from the beginning. You should only give way to the kantas to the extent that is necessary, but you must not give way to them more than you have to. Doing so goes against the basic nature of a bhikkhu who is never complacent. For those who are truly wise, lying down to sleep is only for the purpose of giving a temporary relief to the physical body. They do not expect to gain pleasure or contentment from resting to relieve the tiredness and weakness of the physical kanta. The bhikkhu who lies down as a bhikkhu should must be careful to remind himself of the time to get up, like a deer that lies down to rest while roaming for food must be more mindful and careful than normal. To lie down properly means to carefully set up mindfulness before going to sleep, making the resolve to get up at a predetermined time, not lying down in the manner of one who auctions off his goods as though they were worthless, letting the customer give whatever he feels like for giving them. The bhikkhu who lies down and lets his body go however it will is not a son of the Sakya, a Buddhist who guards the religion, promoting it in himself and others, but a bhikkhu who auctions everything off arbitrarily, letting the buyer fix the price. To lie down properly in the manner of a bhikkhu who is endowed with sila and tamma as religious duties, a bhikkhu must have a regular procedure that he follows before going to sleep. This habit makes him careful and self-possessed when he lies down to sleep. As soon as he wakes up, he must get up quickly and not linger in bed, 
which is the way of a lazy person who tends to get up late and who dies immersed in careless indifference, never waking enough to become aware of himself. Lying down like this is the way of a worthless animal, or of a lazy person who destroys whatever value he has and is unable to rise up and improve himself. Since such behavior is not the way of the sasana, it should not be encouraged, or else it will become a parasite creeper growing within the sasana and within the whole company of Putanga Bhikkhus. It can easily destroy you, just as a parasite creeper destroys the tree on which it depends. You should think about and compare the two concepts of lying down properly and lying down in the usual way. Compare them and search out where they differ, for the lying down properly of a son of the Sakya is very different from the ordinary lying down of people and animals everywhere. Therefore the sons of the Sakya feel that to lie down properly each and every time they rest has a special significance which remains close to their hearts all the time. This is appropriate for one who maintains mindfulness and who has the wisdom to use thought and contemplation in everything that he does, not merely thinking any old way, or speaking any old way, or acting any old way, not merely lying down, waking up, eating, standing, walking, or sitting down any old way. All such negligent behavior fails to live up to the standard of someone who has the status of the son of the Sakya, who should never act in those ways. It is generally understood by people that after the Lord Buddha and each of the Salaka Arahants had entered final Nibbana, they disappeared into oblivion and no longer had any meaning or relationship to the rest of us. But the Tamma, which is the basic causal condition that teaches us to practice in the present, is this not the Tamma of the one who dug deep, searched, and brought it up for the world to see and to follow in practice? And the whole body of this Tamma, how did it remain, and why did it not go into oblivion also? The fact is that both the Buddha and Sankha are the pure heart that has naturally transcended the limits of both death and annihilation. How could the pure chitta die, be consigned to oblivion, or become meaningless when its very nature does not accord with relative convention, samuti? When its nature no longer accords with relative convention, it is not subject to dying, or to being annihilated, or becoming meaningless. Thus buddha is buddha in its own right. Tamma is tamma in its own right, and sankha is sankha in its own right, and they are not shaken or influenced by any of the concepts of the relative world of conventions, which use their authority to create harmful ideas and attitudes within us. So the whole time that we practice tamma which accords with tamma within the heart, it is like coming face to face with the Lord Buddha, the tamma, and the sankha at that time. When we know buddha, tamma, and sankha by natural principles, that knowing must arise in the heart which is the most suitable dwelling place for Tamma. No other vessel is more appropriate to it. This is an example of the teaching with which Venerable Ajahn Man admonished Ajahn Kao in his Samadhi meditation practice when he saw that he had erred in some way. For instance, when he practiced the Tutanga observances incorrectly or not strictly enough, or when he woke from sleep at the wrong time. In truth, Adan Man did not admonish him because he was convinced that he had done something wrong. Rather, he admonished him because he could see that in the future, Adan Kao would be associated with many bhikkhus and large numbers of lay people. For that reason, he often advised and admonished him so that he would become fully conscious of the strict ways of practicing amongst duties. Then he would be able to pass them on to all the other bhikkhus and novices who come to live in dependence on him and they in turn would gain something worthwhile to take away with them, just as Ajahn Mun's disciples had always done. Venerable Ajahn Mun also taught him that all his possessions, such as the bowl, kettle, robes, and other things that he used in his dwelling, should be neatly put away in their proper place. This also included such things as the rags for wiping his feet. Seeing that any of them were not clean enough, he should wash them before putting them to further use. After use, everything should be neatly put away and not just left lying about all over the place. On any day that Adan Kao became so absorbed in other affairs that intruded into his life that he became forgetful or careless, a vision of Adan Man would come to him in the middle of the night while he was practicing Samadhi meditation, admonishing him and pointing out the way of Tamma to him. He stayed alone in that cave for the whole of the Vasa period. 
At night, he was frequently visited by Venerable Ajahn Man, who appeared in his meditation practice as a nimitta. Sometimes, sitting in meditation in the middle of the day when it was very quiet, he also saw Ajahn Man come to visit him in the same way as he did at night. He said that it was very pleasurable for him to be able to ask Ajahn Man all sorts of questions to make his understanding quite clear. Ajahn Man was very proficient at answering questions with great skill and dexterity. He made the answer so clear as to remove all doubt and uncertainty every time. With some questions, Adan Kao had only a feeling of uncertainty, but he did not actually think of asking about it. Nonetheless, at night when he did his meditation practice, Adan Man would come and bring up that question for discussion as though he had just asked him about it. Adan Kao said it was truly strange and wonderful. But he could not tell anyone else, because they would probably pass him off as a mad Gamatana monk. Mostly the tamma for curing the various gilesas arose from the mittas and samadhi meditation, such as those of Ajahn Man coming frequently to admonish him, to show him the right way, and to give him tamma teaching. This promoted his mindfulness and wisdom, making him think and consider carefully, leaving no room for carelessness. In marked contrast to all other places he had lived, the Vasa period that he spent in that cave in the desolate jungle enabled him to develop various skillful methods, both internally and externally, which arose very frequently at all times of the day and night. Adan Kao was someone who lived in the present with joy and tamma in all postures and situations. Whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, he was filled with the bliss of tamma in the midst of the peaceful tamma that was the original foundation of his pure chitta, which was completely pure amidst the various kinds of phenomena that made contact with the heart, displaying their meanings in various ways. The bliss of tamma refreshed his body and mind, making them joyful. Like a tree being cared for and supplied with fertilizer and water, and growing in a suitable climate and environment, which always keeps it fresh and moist both in the trunk and throughout all its branches, twigs, leaves, and fruit. Ajahn Kao said that when the chitta remains only in the present with the calm and peace of tamma, then regardless of how much we get involved in things that are confusing and distracting, we still have nothing but happiness while living in the world of involvement with our own kantas. We need not struggle to find happiness and contentment in other places or other realms, which is merely creating images to deceive ourselves, causing us to develop a strong craving, tanha, which promotes the cause of dukkha, that becomes the fuel which burns us and causes us so much misery. The happiness that is known and experienced in the heart is a happiness which is already sufficient and complete. Then, this entire world and all other worlds, however many there may be in the universe of samsara, appear not to exist. That which does exist, and which is quite clear and apparent, is the chitta with tamma, which seems to cover the whole universe, though it is impossible to explain this or compare it to anything, because there are no characteristics or data by which one can classify it. The chitta that possesses the ultimate tamma, atarya tamma, does not exist within the realms of convention, so there is no basis for making any comparisons or suppositions. Living with Tigers after the end of that Vassa period, some faithful lay supporters from Sawang Dandin in Sogon Nakon province traveled to the cave to invite him to return with them and kindly be their teacher. So he was obliged to leave the place where he had been staying, even though he longed to remain there as he had not thought of going elsewhere for a long time. Having taught the villagers for some time, he took leave of them and went wandering wherever he felt like going in the manner of Tutanga Kamartana Bikus. Sometimes he crossed the Mekong River into Laos, where he stayed on the banks of the river. Later he crossed back into Thailand and continued wandering and practicing the way in Dong Mo Tong, a mountainous area covered with thick jungle which straddles the districts of Bungan and Pon Pisai. In that area were many good places suitable for practicing the way. There were also some newly established villages made up of only a few houses. The people in those villages invited him to spend the Vasa there for their benefit. As it was a place that suited his temperament, he agreed to stay there for the Vasa period. 
While he was staying and practicing Tamma in the hills of the Pon Pisai district, he was fascinated and glad at heart to see all the different kinds of animals living there, for whom he had much metta. The animals he saw included wild fowl, pheasant, all sorts of birds like hornbill and peacock, as well as animals like the palm civet, barking deer, wild boar, ordinary deer, monkeys of various kinds, gibbons, wild dogs, tigers, leopards, elephants, wild oxen, and red bulls. He saw far more of each of those species there than he had seen anywhere else. There were herds of them roaming everywhere. Day and night, he could hear their cries echoing loudly through the forest, each group according to its own natural rhythm. Some days when he went out walking for Bindabada, he saw a large tiger walking most gracefully in the forest ahead of him. It was quite close to him, walking fearlessly, proud and dignified as is its nature. When there was a clearing in the forest ahead of him, it was beautiful to see the way it walked. The first time he saw the tiger, it glanced at him just momentarily and went on walking without looking back at him again, as though it was not in the least afraid of him. But inwardly it was probably careful and watchful, which is in character for an animal that has good mindfulness and is inherently cautious. It does not easily relax and make a mistake. As for a Don Kao, he had no thought of fear for the tiger, because he had seen them before on many occasions. He had heard them growling and roaring so often while staying in the forests that he traveled through, where it was quite normal for such animals to live, that he was quite accustomed to them and had no fear of them. One evening during the Vasa, as he sat teaching the way of Gamartana to the several bhikkhus staying with him, he heard three large striped tigers roaring in the distance, each one in a different direction. After a while, he heard them growling threateningly and fighting with each other. Then they went completely quiet. Later, he heard them growling and fighting close by. In the beginning, he heard them playing and fighting outside the area where the bhikkhus were staying. When they subsequently went quiet, he thought they had moved on somewhere else, but that wasn't the case, for at about 9 p.m. they approached the small meeting hall, the sala, where the bhikkhus were sitting in samadhi, listening to the tamma teaching, and crawled into the space under the floor. The floor of the sala was raised just over one meter above the ground, and the sound of these tigers roaring and growling and fighting there together was so disruptive that Adan Kao had to shout at them, saying, Hey, my three friends! Don't make such a noise. The bhikkhus are listening to a talk on Tamma. Doing evil like this could land you in hell. Don't say I didn't warn you. This is not the right place to cause a commotion, so you should all go away and roar elsewhere. This is a monastery for bhikkhus who like to develop calm, unlike you. So go roar to your heart's content somewhere else where nobody will interfere with you. Here the bhikkhus practice the way of tamma, and they do not give you permission to make a lot of noise and disturbance. As soon as they heard a Don Kao shouting at them, they went quiet and still for a short while, but he could still hear them, as if they were whispering to each other quietly under the sala, saying, We better not make much noise. The bhikkhus are annoyed and shouting at us, so we must talk quietly, or else it will be bad and we may soon end up with sores on our heads. But after a while, they again started growling and playfully fighting each other. They did not seem to want to go elsewhere, as Ajahn Kao had told them to do. It seemed as though they had all agreed that under the floor of the sala was the place for them to play and have fun from dusk until midnight, when they finally went away. Meanwhile, after Ajahn Kao had finished his teaching, the bhikkhus remained sitting there doing their samadhi practice while the three large tigers played, fighting and growling and making a lot of noise under the sala until they went back into the forest at midnight. Only then did the bhikkhus return to their individual dwelling places. This incident was most strange and unusual. For many years, Ajahn Kao had wandered in the way of Gamatana through forested areas in many different parts of the country, but he had never before seen or heard of tigers coming so close to people in a friendly manner, as if they had been close friends of the bhikkhus for a long time. Normally, tigers are instinctively afraid of people, even though they are so powerful that they make people more afraid of them than almost any other animal. 
In general, tigers are more afraid of people than people are of tigers, so they avoid people and keep away from them. Yet these three tigers were not only unafraid of people, they even went to the extent of taking possession of the space under the floor of the small sala to play and have fun together while a lot of bhikkhus were gathered right above them. Apparently they were not in the least afraid of the bhikkhus, who were human beings just like people everywhere. This was quite remarkable, for such animals know nothing of morality, which all people know about, yet their behavior in coming into close proximity to the bhikkhus made it look almost as though they had a good understanding of morality, which they put into practice in the way that people do. They never once displayed any menacing behavior towards the bhikkhus, although they probably did so towards each other in the knowledge that they all understood what their intentions were. Even though it took place a long time ago, I felt as if my hair was standing on end with fear while I listened to a John Kao telling me about this incident, which was rather silly. Foolish, silly people are like that. Even if the Ajans tell them stories which have a moral lesson of tamma buried in them, foolish and incompetent people are unlikely to listen for the purpose of extracting the moral principles from it. Instead, they show their lack of intelligence by focusing just on the storyline itself. Like myself, who showed fear shamelessly in front of Adan Kao while listening to his story. In addition, in writing this book, I am also displaying my timidity for those who read it to laugh at me, which is bad enough. So, having read this, please be careful not to let this kind of story penetrate your heart and haunt it, or else many of you are likely to become timid and silly people also. Most of the bhikkhus who sat in meditation listening to a John Kao teaching that night were stirred up and frightened, both while they sat there and after they left the sala. Their eyes and ears were wide open when they heard the three great teachers crawl under the sala to help a John Kao teach them a lesson. When their sense of contentment was confronted by their fear of tigers, the bhikkhus sitting there were scared stiff. They did not dare to let their chittas wander out freely, for fear that those three teachers might decide to jump up onto the floor of the sala and give them instructions. Actually, the behavior of the three tigers was praiseworthy, in that they did nothing unreasonably excessive or violent, such as leaping onto the floor of the sala. They knew what their basic situation in life was, and to some extent what that of the bhikkhus was, and they did not go beyond what was proper for them in their situation. Their activities were all gentle and harmonious. Then they simply went away. After that they never returned, although the district where the bhikkhus were staying was a place where tigers and all sorts of other animals roamed freely. There was never a night without some tigers wandering about the area, because it was a most suitable living environment for all sorts of wild animals. That whole mountainous area was covered with thick forest, so extensive that it would take a person many days to walk all the way through it. Many varieties of wild animals lived there in large numbers. There were many large herds of elephants and packs of wild boar, and they were not very afraid of people. Many skillful teaching methods occurred to a Don Kao during the year that he lived in that mountainous region. He often had to warn the other bhikkhus who were with him not to be careless in maintaining the Tutanga observances. He reminded them that they were living in an environment which made it necessary for them to be careful of many things. They had to depend on the Tutanga observances as their lifeline, and fully entrust their lives to the Tamma and Vinaya. In that way, they could live happily, without being scared and apprehensive of things in the natural environment that might otherwise have startled them. Adan Kao and his disciples ate very little food, just enough to act as a medicine to support their bodies and keep them going from day to day. The village they depended on for food was newly built and had yet to become firmly established, so they had very few lay supporters. But because they had pledged themselves to Tamma, those bhikkhus intended to train themselves to put up with difficulties for the sake of the Tamma of inner peace. So they were not much concerned about their living conditions or about how much food they got on Pindabada, for such concerns could easily become obstacles in the way of what they were trying to accomplish. As for medical remedies, they considered putting up with pain and fighting sickness by striving hard in Samadhi Pawana to be the most effective cure. They considered the animals that lived in the surrounding forest to be their friends and took them as examples, for they never had any medicines available to them, nor were they born in a hospital with doctors and midwives to aid them, yet there they were, 
animals of all sorts quite able to keep their family lines going, and in large numbers too, and they never showed any grief or discouragement at their lack of medical attention from doctors, nurses, and all sorts of medicines and medical devices. Bhikkhus are human beings. They are sons of the Sakya, the great teacher, whose name resounds throughout the three worlds as one who learned everything there was to know in the books of the three levels of existence by using his endurance, effort, wisdom, skill, and ability to the fullest. Never was he caught at a loss, unable to find a way out, nor was he ever weak and lazy and inclined to give up. If Bhikkhu's retreat, shedding tears just because of the suffering and hardships of the aches and pains experienced in sickness, which are natural conditions of the Kanthas anyway, they are bound to lose out and go bankrupt, and so will not be able to guide themselves or the religion properly. Unless they are courageous and firm in putting up with natural conditions, living and experiencing them all with mindfulness and wisdom to assess and know each and every event that they come into contact with, there is no way to save themselves and escape to a lasting safe haven. When the chitta has been trained in the right way, it will find joy in tamma. It will gladly guide a bhikkhu to the right methods for attaining the path and fruition without changing course or creating obstacles to cause him more trouble. The practice of the way will then steadily progress without slipping backwards, so he won't feel disheartened because he has no inner refuge. He will have the heart with tamma to cleanse, to soothe, and to protect him, causing him to feel peaceful and secure. Then, wherever he goes or wherever he stays, he is inherently content Sugato, in the manner of true disciples of the Tathagata, without any signs of impoverishment in his heart. Those Tudangakamurtana bhikkhus who are intent on tamma go about and live their lives like this. They can stay anywhere and go anywhere, for they are prepared to put up with hardship and hunger while remaining contented and free from anxiety, with tamma as the object of attachment, a ramana of their hearts. It may be difficult for the reader to accept some of the things that happen in connection with the forest animals that like to come and live close to bhikkhus. So to begin with, it may be better to consider domestic animals, which people like to look after with metta in their homes and animals that seek sanctuary in the monasteries. The number of animals such as dogs and birds that want to live in monasteries increases every day until there is hardly any room left for the dogs or trees left for the birds. Having thought about the domestic animals with which we are all familiar, we can go on to consider the various kinds of wild animals that tend to hang around the forest locales or the monasteries where Tudanga bhikkhus tend to stay. I have already written about such animals in the books Biography of Venerable Ajahn Mun and Paribada, where many incidents are related of animals coming to live near the bhikkhus, all of which are experiences that I know to be true. From the viewpoint of Tamma, these stories are quite interesting, for Tamma is the principle of nature that gives peace and happiness, and Tamma treats all species equally, regardless of whether or not they actually understand what Tamma is. There is something which manifests in the experience of all beings that they are happy to accept, something which no one dislikes. That something is the natural Tamma which manifests as calm and happiness, as peace as trust and confidence, as goodwill, as metta, as affection and compassion, and as tolerance in which others are free to come or go as they will, without fear or danger. These are some of the things that flow from tamma. Animals of all kinds like it and readily accept it, without any need to attend school to be taught about it. The chitta is far more compatible with the outflow of tamma than it is with the possession of external titles, rank, or authority, which are like ornaments that increase one's self-importance, but can easily dissolve away and disappear depending on circumstances which are fickle and uncertain. Therefore, although animals don't really know what tamma is, they will tend to search on their own for those things which they naturally like and can readily accept. For instance, stray dogs staying in a monastery, or wild animals living close by Tudanga Bhikkhus. Animals instinctively understand that tamma, which means peace and security, is to be found in those places, so they search for it in their own way. 
Even people who've never shown any interest in Tamma know those places which are secure and safe, and they enjoy relaxing and having fun in such places. They realize that it would not be safe to act like that in other places. This has been the case from ancient times to the present day. This explanation should be sufficient to understand how Tamma and the places where people live and practice Tamma make animals and people everywhere feel confident and free from danger so they tend to relax and dispense with their usual caution. There are even some who go so far as to forget themselves completely, without stopping to consider how other people feel about it, or whether their behavior is appropriate for the religion, which is the treasure of the whole country. Even people like that know the difference between good and evil. They know the difference between good people and bad people, between good animals and bad animals, in the same way that people everywhere do so they should think of others and how much they cherish their treasure, and they should refrain from letting go of all restraint. Limits and bounds exist within which people and animals should remain, each in its own sphere. They should not mix up their modes of behavior until they are all behaving in the same way, so one cannot tell which is which. Venerable Ajahn Kao had always liked wandering about the countryside, searching for secluded places so he frequently moved from one place to another. Even when staying in one locale, he liked to wander Tutanga through the surrounding forests and hills, frequently changing the place where he did his meditation. For example, he used a certain location as his base, but in the morning he would walk off somewhere else to do his practice. Then in the afternoon he would go to another place, and at night he would wander off to yet another place, all in the vicinity of his base. He also used to change the direction he went in, sometimes going far and sometimes close by. At times he would change to another cave, moving from the cave which was his base, or he would go up to a rocky outcrop at the top of the mountain, returning to his base dwelling only late at night. During the period when he was engaged in a fierce struggle with his kilesas, he preferred this style of practice because he found that when he changed his situation constantly, wisdom would arise all the time. Then none of the Gileses were able to get a grip on him, because they were constantly up against the skillful means of mindfulness and wisdom which beat them into a corner, trapping them so that they could be forced out and got rid of time after time. If he stayed always in one place, he would become accustomed to his surroundings and complacency would set in. But the Gileses would not become complacent. They would keep increasing regardless of what he was accustomed to, so he had to change about altering his methods and his environment very frequently in order to keep up with the deceptive tricks of the Gileses, for once they established themselves, they would accumulate and fight against him incessantly, without ever taking time off for rest. If there was any respite from them, it was only in deep, dreamless sleep. Otherwise, they were working all the time. Because of this, if he relaxed or weakened his efforts while striving to develop himself, putting off doing the practice and letting time slip by, it encouraged the ever-diligent Gileses to laugh at him. By changing locations and methods of practice very frequently, he could have some success in defeating the Gileses, which had no chance to feel satisfied that they were the sole master in charge. His reasoning was most intriguing and his practice was an excellent example for those who refused to let the Kilesos rise up and walk all over them due to an easy-going overconfidence that ruins every move that the Chitta makes. Venerable Ajahn Kao liked to wander in the districts of Pu Sing, Pu Wua, Pu Lanka, Dong Mo Dong, and in the districts of Ampea Zeka and Ampea Pon Pisai in Nong Kai province, as well as Ampua Ban Pang in Nakon Panom province. These areas had plenty of mountains, such as Pu Sing, Pu Wua, and Pu Lanka, which were all places suitable for the practice and development of Tamma. But they were far away from villages, too far to go Pindabada, so it was necessary to have people take turns bringing him food. All these places were full of wild animals of all sorts, including tigers, elephants, wild gaur, and red oxen, among many others. In the afternoon and evening, he could hear their calls and roars echoing throughout the forest. Anyone who had not truly overcome death would find it difficult to stay there, because there were many tigers in those places, far more than in other regions, and they were not afraid of people. Some nights, 
as he walked in meditation, one of the tigers would creep up and crouch down to watch him walking, without any fear of him at all. But it never harmed him. It may have simply wondered what he was up to, so it crept close to sniff and have a look. As soon as Atan Kao heard an unusual sound that made him suspicious, he would shine his flashlight there, only to see a great tiger leap away, sometimes very close in front of him. Even after that, he was able to go on walking Junkuma, doing his meditation without any fear that the tiger might return to jump on him, maul him, and eat him. His faith in Tamma was stronger than his fear of the tiger, so he was able to persist and keep on doing his practice. Sometimes in the evening, he would climb up the hillside, from where he could see large herds of elephants going for a walk along a large area of rocky outcrops that stretched for miles. As the rocky area was not covered by forest, he could quite clearly see both large and small elephants going out to search for food. While watching those elephant herds having fun teasing each other and playing together, he became quite happily absorbed until the evening was late and it got too dark to see. It seems they liked to tease each other and play together in the same way as people do.